Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We have a very interesting show tonight. First, have you ever wanted to keep your data safe? Anybody want safe data? I am my priority list. (laughs) Santa Claus, bring me safe data. Yeah. And then second. Trademark terror. (laughs) The special feature tonight, we're going to be talking about trademarks and what happens if you don't have one. And then thirdly, I have been waiting a long time to get this gal on. Industry that has been around for thousands of years, she is dragging it into the new millennium. Absolutely. People are dying to get into it, so <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> I made that joke before the show started, and everybody just kind of went, what? But you'll find it, out. <laughs> but you'll find out. So first of all, on the data piece, we'd like to introduce to you uh, Shavis Camp. And Shavis, welcome to the show. Thanks uh, for having me. It's great to be here. And I'll tell you, you know, Warren Buffett believes that cybercrime is a bigger threat to our worldwide finance and people in the world than nuclear weapons. Really? It's, it's pretty crazy. Has anybody been killed by cybercrime? Actually, yeah. There, there have been some deaths. It's rare, but especially <laughs> when you're dealing- I tripped over my thumb drive. Yeah, okay. <laughs> especially when you're dealing with medical records and medical devices, because everything now is connected to the internet. We are all connected by this worldwide web, to use the colloquialism, okay? And smallpox, okay? The Black Plague- these all affected eh, something north of about 50% of the world's populations, right? And killed about half the people in Europe. One of them did. And that was really horrible. That was really horrible. But even those horrible diseases were not as well connected as we are now today in the internet, which puts every single person in the country, every single person in the even remotely developed world at risk for cybercrime. So who are these people that are trying to ruin our lives? Well, some of them are sponsored by nation states, some of which claim to be our friends, okay? So you've got well-funded groups. And we're not talking, you know, the the honorable mobsters like you'd see in some of the old, leave the gun, take the cannoli, okay? (laughs) No, no. Where's that from? Come on now. These are well-funded, and they are scorched-earth-style criminals. And they don't care who you are. They want your money. They want your wealth. They want your business. They want your information. They want your credit. They want your medical records. They want your employees' information. They want your family's information so that they can sell it and make a profit, and they really don't care how they get it. Well, and then there's those ones that hold your data for ransom, right? That is 100% true. We've got ransomware, which is a massive issue right now. We just had some really egregious ransoms in the multiple millions of dollars where a piece of ransomware got onto a network. It encrypted all of the data. Their backups weren't working. And these criminals came in and demanded large sums of money to get that information back. And at the end of the day, they didn't have the money to pay it. So what does that mean? You're not getting your data back. Wow. That's a pretty hard line. I mean, I have to admit, I get emails all the time. And some of them are so good. But they're scams. But they're so good. And even in the world of intellectual property, our clients get fake letters all the time from made-up intellectual property organizations asking them to spend thousands of dollars and it's all a big fraud i mean it's just getting out of control it's completely out of control one of my own clients sent me an email that they got they'd actually replied to it because at first they thought it was legitimate okay and and these aren't stopped by any spam filter generally because it is literally someone typing at a keyboard into a gmail account or into a yahoo account sending a personal looking email so it's not something that our technology currently can easily block. And it said, hey, had the name of the president of the company as the from line. Hey, I'm in a meeting. I cannot talk. I need you to do me a favor. Are you available? And she replied, yeah, I am. Okay. I need you to wire this amount of money to this thing for this particular deal right now. And I need you to handle that as soon as possible. Can you do that? Yeah. Can you give me some more details? That's when she realized, you know what, this might not be a good idea. And so thankfully, she, <laughs> she reached out to me, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. no more, no more. Okay, and we, we looked, and sure enough, I saw the email chain, and it was I, I was able to use it as an educational piece. Okay, here's what to look for, but it was very well done. And people in my industry are used to this because as a value-added reseller, which is one of the terms that applies to people in my industry, 
We've been getting these emails for years trying to impersonate college procurement departments or government agencies trying to convince us to sell or to ship them easily transferable devices like hard drives, memory, SSDs, things like that, that they could easily turn over and would disappear. And they say, well, we'll pay you net 30 and here's a purchase order. And some people would actually fall for it. Thankfully, today, very few of us. So we've been seeing this for years. Now they are really starting to target individuals and businesses. So what do you think? I mean, there must be some estimates someplace about how much this is actually costing people. You know? Current estimates are about two to four trillion dollars. This is approaching the scale of the global cocaine trade wow. in profitability for the bad guys and damages for those of us who are left in its wake. And how many businesses or individuals are actually affected, actually lose money or get defrauded through these schemes? I don't have that statistic. It is an immense number because everyone gets it, and it's about every 14 seconds another business gets hit with ransomware okay, or gets hit with some form of malware. And I will tell you, though, 60% of those that suffer a loss either never reopen their doors or close within a year. It can be substantial. If you're talking millions of dollars to get your data back. Well, it doesn't even have to be millions. A small client of mine had to spend $80,000. Now, they were not a client of mine when they got hit. They called me. I was sitting on the tarmac at the Charlotte airport, and I get a phone call from them. I'm on the, oh, gosh, can I please just get home? It's a red eye. I've been up since 2 o'clock in the morning the day before, and they got hit with ransomware. Hey, Chavis. You know our system. We need your help to help rebuild because our IT guy, he, we lost everything. All our systems, everything. And you, you set this up years ago. You know it. Help us. Well, you know what? I got some bad news for you. This might not work. I said, I'm on the case. I'll do whatever I can for you. But 60% of these businesses go under, and I just want to make sure you're aware of that. I said, the good news is the doors are closing on the airline, and I'll be home in two hours. I'll give you a call. They were only closed for two weeks. Well, can they get your data if it's in the cloud? Oh, absolutely. They get your data in the cloud the same way you get your data. They access it via the username and password that you use, either via a phishing scam trying to send you an email or send you some sort of legitimate-looking website to get access to your data via your own password, or they use a password that you have used in multiple places, which is why you should never reuse your passwords on multiple websites, multiple systems. Every single system should have a separate password that you change reasonably often depending on the security of that particular system. So let me just interrupt sure. here because we have so many different systems, so many different passwords. I mean, to have a different password for each one and to change them all the time, I mean, that, that seems like a huge job. It's a huge burden. And thankfully, though, this is 2019. We're almost in 2020 now. Uh -huh. There are apps that do this for you. There are apps that do this for you that are even reasonable for individuals to have, right? Okay, so you can go on the App Store. My personal favorite right now is Password Boss. It's a great little app. Next one is LastPass, and the two of those work great for just individuals to keep their passwords safe. It integrates with your web browsers, your cell phone, everything, so all of your passwords are in one spot, and you really only need to worry about one password that is a master password for that system. Now, Chavis, you're storing all your passwords in one place. You're the IT guy. You told us that was bad. Well, it used to be, okay? These new apps keep all of that data encrypted using the passcode that you've set, right? So it's safe. And if it gets stolen, it's all encrypted and the bad guys can't get it as long as you haven't used that password, that one special password somewhere else. So tell me, I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask you this anyway. Should we use our pets' names for No, passwords? no, that's not, that, that, we know the answer to that. No, no. pets' names, no children's <laughs> names, no birth dates. No. So should you let your computer memorize your password so the next time oh, you go on that question. site? Because, I mean, I do that all the time. So, like, take, for instance, everybody knows I buy tons of shoes from Zappos. So, so if somebody wants to break into your Zappos account? Well, <laughs> but I mean, seriously, if, if I let the computer save my Zappos password, does that make it easy for them to get it? I don't generally consider that safe, especially not when we're talking about saving it within the browser, because I mean, Google does a good job with security. Let's not let's not get it wrong. But that is not well encrypted and is not in a separate system like some of these other password managers. It's not a bad stopgap to at least keep your password in there, but it's more of 
designed for convenience, not for security. And I've never found that to be a great thing. So I'm sorry. Yeah. The other catch is it's not just the Zappos password stored in your browser. Are you using your Zappos password anywhere else? So when Zappos gets hacked and somebody manages to get their password database, are they going to be able to take your email address and that password and use that somewhere else that was important to you? Well, I have no idea because I don't remember what that password is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's the danger of doing that. <laughs> I, I don't know most of my passwords anymore. I keep them in a particular app with a very long but easily remembered for me password. So then how do you get them from the app into like Zappos, for instance? Well, on a computer, on a regular computer with a web browser, there's a little extension that you install that automatically tries to put that password in or at least prompts you and says, hey, you've got three logins for this account. Anyone who's ever had Google in a business probably has like three Google logins, right? Mm -hmm. Which one of these is the correct one? Okay, that one. Great. You're good. And it puts it in and goes. Does the same thing on your phone. So is password safety like the number one tip that you would give entrepreneurs who want to protect their data? The number one tip I would have to say, and this is something that's floated around for a long time, but people are still doing it. Don't use free Wi-Fi. Seriously, don't use free Wi-Fi at the hotel, at the airport, on the subway. Don't use free Wi-Fi. Or if you do, you need to have a VPN app. There are several good ones. You got to pay money for them, okay? But you can use those to keep yourself safe. If you can use your cellular data, just use it. And that's really the biggest one I have. So we actually just had someone on the show recently, Fetch app, that I actually downloaded that it makes your phone into a hotspot for your computer so you don't have to use the Wi-Fi at the hotel. That's actually not a bad idea. That actually works really well. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to use it. We're going to go to Pittsburgh soon. That hotspot of <laughs> cyber activity. You never know. <laughs> you never know. No, you really don't and, know. I mean, if you're typing bad things about the Steelers or something like that, you're bound to get hit. But Here's the thing. The device is only about, say, two inches by a uh, half an inch thick that I can have in a backpack anywhere, okay? So the guy sitting next to you at Starbucks with a backpack, a laptop, and a bad attitude could be sitting there sniffing your passwords if you're connected to that free Wi-Fi. The same goes, the guy could be in the next room from you at your hotel. You just don't know. Yeah, a lot of these people are able to set up fake Wi-Fi connections. So you think you're at Starbucks, you think you're logging into the Starbucks Mm -hmm. network, and you're really logging into their network. Yeah, that's exactly what this little device does. You can build one for less than 100 bucks. Okay, now I'm never doing that again. (laughs) (laughs) I own one. I own one that the legitimate guys, the white hats, like like me and my company and my people, we use one that's pre-engineered for us and designed for us, but bad guys can make one of those for about $100 worth of parts. If they really want a fancy one, they can spend $200 on it. So that's really, though, a top tip for tech entrepreneurs mm-hmm. because oftentimes they are somewhere else using some other Wi-Fi. That's right. I would think most of them would not be using public Wi-Fi. Right. The few times that I've done it, I guess I thought, well, you know, my cell phone isn't working. I'm just going to check my email. And I guess in that 60 seconds when I'm hooked up to the free public Wi-Fi, somebody can jump in and start grabbing my stuff. Yes, they can. And you'll generally see an error message most of the time, but don't count on it. Right. You see it. You might dismiss it quickly. You accidentally tap, say, continue, because you've probably seen that error before. And oh, gosh, that thing again. Continue. Go away. Just let me get my email. And next thing you know, you've just given them access to any of the data in that connection. But really, the number one tip that I would have to offer to anyone, not just entrepreneurs, but any individual, is know that you're a target. Know that in 2019, you are a target of these scammers and these criminals. Your information, your money, everything, they want it. And even if you don't have anything that you think is valuable, your information can be used to fraudulently get information from your family members who might have something that's of value, or at least they think it's of value. Well, it was interesting because we had just a couple weeks ago done this show, and Richard checks his bank account like 100 times a day. (laughs) Right after the show, he's like, oh my gosh, somebody is using my card. And we caught it within a few minutes of seeing the first charges, but they had charges from REI and it must have been between 50 and $200. Mm-hmm. And we ran right over to where we do our bank and they closed the account and they gave us a new card. And we do try to check our financial statements. I think that's another thing, right? You should try to check your financial statements every day if you can. I checked my credit card statement. Somebody had charged a $2,000 computer at the Apple store 
and they were going to go pick it up. So I called the police, and I don't know what happened, but I got my money back. And I really recommend folks use a true credit card, not a debit card, for purchases, everyday purchases. I don't care if it's $5 at Starbucks or $5,000 at some electronic store. Use a credit card because if that gets stolen and you don't have it linked directly to your bank account, it's not your money. Who cares? It's not going to keep your rent check, your mortgage check, or some other important thing from bouncing. Because let's face it, if something hits your personal bank account, yeah, you're going to get the money back. There's consumer protections that allow for that. Even on the credit cards and debit, even if they draft money directly from your personal account, there's consumer protections. You'll get that money back. Might take a few days. What happens in the meantime is you get to make a phone call to your mortgage company and explain why the check just bounced. And that's not a fun conversation to have. I've had to do that because that happened to me about 10 years ago. Was that before you were in the cybersecurity business? No, but it was certainly before I learned to use a credit card for everything and stop using it. It happened to my business account, too, about seven years ago. Same thing. So no matter who you are, they're out there looking for you. They're out there looking. I'll tell you, I got to meet Kevin Mitnick a few weeks ago and share the stage with him at a national event down in Dallas. Can you explain who that is? Of course. Kevin Mitnick is one of the most famous hackers in the entire world. He was caught by the FBI in a cat and mouse game back in the 80s. Fantastic guy. He now runs a cybersecurity company. And while I was sharing the stage with him, I got to ask him, hey, Kevin, have you ever been hacked? He's like, no, 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 I've never been. Well, there was that one time (laughs) while I was under a judge's order not to touch a computer, my website got hacked. (laughs) <laughs> and it actually took down the entire web host. And so that company actually came to me and said, we, we can't do business with you anymore. And so I had, had to move the website. I couldn't do it because I couldn't touch a computer. So even one of the most world famous hackers has been hit. It happens to everybody. So you have to check things constantly. Constantly, especially if you're a business owner, because the consumer protections that apply to your personal bank account do not apply to a business account. So you have exactly two days to dispute a charge other than credit card charges, right? If something drafts your account, you have two days to dispute that charge. That's it. The bank does not have to give you that money back after two days. For a business account. For a business account. So if you have a business account, you should check it at least once a day. Once a day. Business owners have multiple bank accounts, okay? Have multiple business bank accounts. Have one that you use for your payables. Have one that you use for income where you deposit everything. Have one operating account, okay? Separate from everything else. And if you absolutely must have a debit card, make sure it is linked to one account that is not linked to any of your others so that if that gets compromised, none of your major payables, you know, your employees' paychecks don't get siphoned off by cyber criminals. Well, that's great advice. So, Shavis, we're starting to get to the end of the segment here. What are your final words of wisdom for entrepreneurs who are looking to protect their data? So we talked about passwords. We talked about thinking about you're a target, not using public Wi-Fi. Are there any other steps that they can take? The best thing you can do is align yourself with a good security and information technology professional who can help navigate you through some of this. Everybody's like, oh, I want to do it myself because I'm trying to keep everything on the low. I get it. But find someone who can work with you to at least point you in the right direction and help grow with you as you grow your business. And that being said, how can our listeners contact you? They can get to me through my website, www.chaviscamp.com. C-H-A-V-O-U-S, camp, C-A-M-P, dot com. Or for our French listeners, Shavu. Shavu. <laughs> Actually, very good. That sounds great. So you're listening to Passage to Profit in English, but once in a while you get a little French thrown in there. And we'll be right back after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. 
office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. I just had a fascinating discussion with Shavis Camp about data security, and now we're on to our media maven, Kenya Gibson. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me back. So before we get into this, I want to know what a maven is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a witty, clever, kind of all-knowing person in a particular field. I think, that, I think that fits her but perfectly. But you left out creative. Thank That's you. the first word I would use to describe you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So today we're going to be talking about trademark terror. and Terror. Uh, did I say that wrong? No, I'm just R- emphasizing real it. Real terror. <laughs> yes. This was and a terrifying fact, situation. And, and we're actually talking now in the studio, and as I'm looking at Kenya, the look of terror is coming back on her face. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually feel very relieved, and, and that's thanks to you and Elizabeth, because I had a really not so good day late last week before the holiday, something I've been working on, gosh, for like three or almost four years that I had named, that I had pretty much um, procrastinated getting trademarked because that was my intention. I was on Instagram scrolling around and noticed that somebody was using the name in an ad, and I, like, freaked out. It's, it's the worst feeling ever when you've worked so hard on something and you see someone using it and you're like, oh, my God, like, that's mine. But it's not really until you have a trademark. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's where the both of you came in. And I called Elizabeth right away. Right. <laughs> yes. With terror in her voice. And I called Richard and said, get someone on this right now. Yeah. And I and did. It, <laughs> and you did. And you just everything went so quickly and smoothly. And I appreciate that because I think people don't realize that there's like a lot of steps involved when you're trying to trademark a name and usage of anything. But like when I tell you, it, it was literally within like 24 hours you guys turned that around for me so I'm like so grateful to you because I wanted to go into the holiday at peace and at ease not having to worry about the situation because it's it's like if you feel like someone's stealing your puppy oh I know and we're absolutely happy to provide that service we were glad that we could support you and for our clients when emergencies like that arise we do take action and act quickly because we want to limit the damage and the consequences so one of the advantages of working with a law firm as opposed to going to a website is that when situations come up you have somebody to talk to about it understand your options come up with a plan for taking action and defending your intellectual property which is what we did Yeah, and I don't think people realize there's a lot of different classes and information that you need. Like, you just don't go to a website and just file a name. Like, there's a lot of steps. Right, and the first thing our attorney, James Klobuchar, did was a search. And we have proprietary software that we pay for, and he searched that database and to see if anybody was using it. And I believe there was somebody using it, but it was a different class of goods. So it was open for what you were trying to do with it. And he found other things that were close to it, too. But people don't realize it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So you have to look at what's close to it, what class of goods they're in, et cetera. So he was able to do all that. Yeah. And it was a very thorough process. So you feel good about, like, what you're filing? Because I think some people think it's just, oh, I'm just going to go trademark this. And it's just not how it works. And it's not something that I would have felt comfortable doing on my own. I consider myself to be a maven in other areas, <laughs> but not when it comes to things like this. Like, this is not my area of expertise. I, I'm like any other normal person out there who is a creator and an entrepreneur who comes up with a lot of ideas, I would say, on a regular basis, who doesn't really know how to go about protecting them. And I'm thankful to have you too. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, it was our complete and total pleasure. And trademarks can be deceptively simple. You think, oh, it's a word. I fill out a form, I send it into the trademark office, I get my trademark, end of the day. But there's really a whole universe of laws and regulations that surround this trademark. And so it is a legal document, and it does take legal skill to prepare and file a trademark application. Unless you do it yourself, it's illegal to file a trademark application unless you're an attorney. And I think... You do even better if you work with attorneys who specialize in trademark law and they understand all of the subtleties and is this mark really the same or is it different? 
you know, making minor changes in the spelling of a name, for example, or putting a hyphen or two words together versus separated. In the world of trademarks, those aren't substantial differences, right? And so you need to have someone who can tell you that and hopefully save you from a disaster. Mm -hmm. so. And when time is not on your side, that was probably one of the worst feelings ever because you're just like, oh, oh my God, like, like, what do I do? Like, this is, it's kind of already out there. It's good to have experts like Gearheart Law to go to to really kind of help push that process through because who knows how long it would have taken by the time I went and researched what to do and what steps, and so it was helpful. And one of that. the great things about trademarks, too, is the person who uses it first is the one that has superior rights, not necessarily the one who files the trademark mm -hmm. first. So I think in your case, I think you're a first user, and as a consequence, you'll hopefully get a trademark and then stop this infringing activity. And just like knowing that now kind of puts the whole context on it. It's like maybe I am getting ripped off here, but there's something I can do about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lose all the brand equity that I've spent a lot of time, effort, and money generating. So when do you think the trademark would get issued? Like how long does that normally take? Well, it varies, but it's about eight months before the mark issues. So then can she make them stop using it? We can still take steps to stop it. That's a strategic decision. Even if you are a first user, you have common law trademark rights, which accrue the minute you start using the mark. Is it better to chase somebody with common law rights versus a federal trademark registration? Federal trademark registration is a lot stronger, but there are steps that we can take. We can send them cease and desist letters. We can contact them, and we can hopefully just discourage them. It's a bigger deal than people think, and I think I'm like most people who kind of procrastinate when it comes to things like that, and then you wait, and then sometimes it's not in your favor, and it's too late. So I definitely recommend if you have an idea or you have a name or something that, especially you, you're very passionate about and you've been working hard on, to like act sooner than later because you just never know. You just never know. And what do you need to prove that you're using it? Like in Kenya's case, she's been using it for a few years. What does the USPTO want to see? Well, usually you want to just show evidence that the mark is being used in commerce for business transactions. So an invoice, brochure, website, marketing materials, all of those things are... Instagram? Instagram can be used as uh, specimens. There aren't real bright lines about what acceptable specimens are, so that's sometimes a subject of debate between the patent attorney and the trademark office. So that's another reason to have an attorney involved because they've submitted hundreds of trademark applications and they know what kinds of specimens are going to be acceptable and which ones are likely to be rejected. And so that just makes the whole process uh, smoother. But but in any case, materials that you would generate when you're actually running the business. It's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, I mean, I'm, like I said, I think the biggest lesson I learned in all of this is, you know, if you have something that you want to protect and you have built brand equity, that you want to make sure that you take the proper steps. It's not a good feeling, especially when you work so hard and you see someone using something so blatantly. And you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, you shouldn't be using that. <laughs> that would make me so mad. <laughs> I gotta tell you. I'm like, um, hello. <laughs> I, that was my my intellectual property. I thought of that. Right. That was I mine. own that. It's right. flattering, but in the same sense, you're just like it's it's not a good feeling. You feel violated. You do. You know that's the word that we hear a lot. And uh, when somebody's taking something that you've worked so hard to perfect. And it's amazing how, I mean, how often do you see that happen? We see it happen a lot. And lots of times there's things that we can do, like in your case, but other times it may be a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. And so if you wait too long, then the facts sort of get away from you. Right. You lose a little bit of control. And sometimes it becomes too late to file on your intellectual property. Of course, We'll always do everything we can to support you and help out mm -hmm. in a difficult situation. But the longer you wait, the more risk you take. And so we always recommend that new businesses file that trademark as soon as possible. In the end, it's not that expensive, maybe $1,500. I mean, that can be a lot of money. But for the insurance, if you put tens of thousands of dollars of sweat equity and advertising into your business and mm -hmm. something happens and you have to start over again or you pick a mark that somebody else has, these are risks that we see and we see problems like this every day. Elizabeth and I were talking on the break about what most people do when they see someone using their oh, idea or their, their mark, what typically happens? Because I thought most people would panic like me and then 
called Gear Heart Law, but that's not what everybody does. No, a lot of people are just like, oh, well, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they try to ignore it. But then if they start making money, like that's where it really gets, or if the other person just tramples all over them, or sometimes maybe they're in negotiations with somebody and they have filed it and somebody just takes it and uses it, then they want more recourse from that. So I think most people kind of take trademarks for granted. You know, there's so many trademarks out there. There's so many like companies that have had them forever, like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Apple, you know, you just don't really think about them. But honestly, if you look at Coca-Cola, Apple, IBM, they guard their trademarks religiously. They absolutely are zealous about it. And lots of times what happens, people become infatuated with their name and it maybe is not trademarkable. And they say, eh, well, you know, who cares? Nothing's ever going to happen. But when they become successful, that's when the problems start. And then that's where it gets really expensive to unwind the issue. You have to go through litigation or you have to pay license fees. And so much better to start off on a clean slate. And we see it over and over and over again. So this is a good wake up call. There's plenty of things that we can do to help. But you did the right thing. I called Gerhardt Law. I called <laughs> Gerhardt Law and I felt much better and I had a wonderful Thanksgiving because of it. <laughs> There's one more thing, Richard. You don't actually have to have used it to file yet. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, trademarks are ultimately based on use in the United States, outside the United States. So whoever registers first gets the rights. But there are definitely advantages to filing an intent to use application. So if you're planning to start a business and you have the name chosen already, but you haven't launched the business yet, you can file an intent to use trademark. And that gives you certain important rights in the trademark process. It also puts you through the important discipline of going through and finding out if there are other names that could be asserted against you. So that is also a big issue. If you pick a name, somebody else has a trademark, then there's problems there. So if you go through the intent to use application, you've selected a name, but you haven't launched your business yet, you can file a trademark application, sort of, you know, stake your claim and get the application process started. And it gives you peace of mind. I think a peace of mind is priceless. Like you can't put a price on that. Absolutely. And many, if not most businesses are known or noticed based on their name mm -hmm. and their brand. Mm -hmm. You pick a slogan or a name connected to the business. And so it's a very important piece of the marketing part of your company. Yep. So what do we learn, kids? You don't want to be <laughs> a victim of trademark, trademark terror. terror. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Save Yourself show, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't want to get your data stolen. And, and no you don't one... want to get your intellectual property stolen. No, <laughs> right? no. And it's good to know that there are people out there who can help you with these things, too. Yes. So. The good old people like your heart law. I have a question. What if Kenya already had this trademark and she ignored this person who was violating it and didn't vigorously defend it, can she lose some rights to her trademark at some point? Or will she always be able to even two years from now, three years from now, say, well, you know what, now I'm tired of you offending you know, on my trademark and go after them? Or is it something where you lose your rights over a period of time? That's a great question. You can wait a little while, but you can't wait forever once you know about the infringement. So Eventually, you do want to take action. If you don't take action against a known infringer, but you want to take action against somebody else later on down the line, one of the things your adversary will do is point out, well, you didn't go after them. You know, you shouldn't be able to come after me, right? And so that creates a dilution of your trademark rights. And so it is important to enforce it. Now, enforcement may just be that you call up the person and you say, we're going to agree on concurrent use. Even though we have the superior trademark rights and you came later, uh, I don't really want to get into a big litigation. If you agree to stay in Brooklyn and we agree to stay in Manhattan, then we can both use our mark. And it doesn't cost anything. It's yeah. just the cost of, of an agreement. Yeah, and you're that, no threat to us. Basically. You're no threat. And so we, we don't want to spend the money to sue you and we can peaceably coexist. And that constitutes enforcement. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive enforcement activity. Sure. It just needs to be that you're paying attention and making good decisions about your trademark rights. That is a really good point. And you made me think of something. I've had so much fun here at iHeart doing this that I started interviewing our attorneys <laughs> and um, did vlog posts. So I have them on our website and I have a vlog post, I guess, um, video post on our website with our trademark litigator at Gearheart Law, Sergey Orell. And we address a lot of the infringement points on that 
video blog. So if you go to the Gear Heart Law website, there's also an interview with Richard about Gear Heart Law and one with our international attorney, David Postalski. All those are in our blog on our website and you can find out a lot. And we have a YouTube channel that has more informational data as well. Lots of good stuff. So thank you for joining us, Kenya. Oh, it was thanks for having me. I feel you. much better today. <laughs> <laughs> Trademark relief. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. We'll be right back after this message. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley's the Inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, eVine Live and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. If you were here at the beginning of the show, you heard me say that we were going to have someone talk about bringing an industry that has been around for thousands of years into the new millennium and it is really pretty amazing what valerie is doing so welcome valerie reed and oh, tell us a, what you're doing it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> thank you so much richard and elizabeth for inviting me i'm super super excited uh, yes so my business partner scott bradley and i co-founders of a site called simple cremation online and what we're doing is we're putting funeral homes together with consumers on the internet how about that so Sounds great. Has the site ever been hacked? <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Getting lists of dead I, people. <laughs> I learned so much from Seamus because really we have a lot of intimate information. Can you imagine? I guess you, you would. Know, yeah, the, absolutely. You know, social security numbers and uh, credit cards and all sorts of things like that. So I'm going to take a lot of tips from him. Thank you so much. How does it work? How does your website work? How does your business work? You know, what we've done is we've pulled together a network of local funeral homes. These are top quality funeral homes all over the country. And we have a website where people can come on and search in their local area and then find the funeral home that will service them and uh, perform the cremation, take care of their loved ones. How do they get the body to the crematorium? Each funeral home has a staff that will do that very professionally. And, you know, the death might have occurred in a hospital. It might be at home. You know, it might be at a senior living home. Wherever the uh, loved one is, the funeral home will then find them and uh, take them into their care. So do you have to go to the funeral home? Like, could you do everything online or do you have to? Yeah, well, great question. That's actually the purpose of the site is you do not need to go to a funeral home until you want to um, pick up their cremains or you can even have those mailed to you if you happen to be in California and your loved one is. Um, yesterday I was talking to um, a gal whose um, mother is in Illinois. She's in California. So she's unfortunately unable to come to Illinois. So having to arrange the cremation all online, yeah. Do people plan their own? They do, absolutely. Every day of the week, they do plan their own. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, yeah. I wonder what that's like. I, you know, I was watching this movie the other night called The Irishman uh -huh. with Robert De Niro. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. Oh, it's that's super, it's super yeah. good. It's a story about, like, Jimmy Hoffa and, like, all the gangsters. Yeah. And in the movie, he starts to plan his own funeral. Uh -huh. Like, he goes out and he picks out all the stuff and he goes right. and he meets. And I'm like, God, it's... It's morbid, but it, like it's kind of essential. Right. I think it's a real generational thing. I think the generations are changing. I think the boomers, less so than the current generation that's making the funeral arrangements for themselves, they're less likely to plan it in advance. I kind of like the idea of planning my own funeral. It just gives me a... <laughs> <laughs> good. And so does everybody else. No. Uh, <laughs> but it kind of gives you a feeling of control. And it definitely takes the burden off of the next generation. And that's really what um, is driving a lot of people who are pre-planning their funerals. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's a great help to your heirs. It, 
my mother just pre-planned hers right after my aunt passed away. And yes. here my mother is trying to plan a funeral and trying to figure all this stuff out. Thankfully, she had good legal representation, good help, all that stuff, a loving son to help, all that. But she had to do all that. So she looked at, she, you know, I need to do this for myself. So now she's gone out and gotten everything planned and everything wow. arranged That's to make amazing. sure that when something does happen to her, because she's not a spring chicken, mm -hmm. But it's not going to be a burden. But, you know, the thing is, too, that if you do prearrange the funeral, you have to make sure that your next of kin know that you've done this. Exactly. Because when my mom passed away, she was in Arizona, and we all flew out. We did all of the arrangements. We set up the funeral. And then when I was going through her papers several weeks oh, later, I found goodness. this prepaid funeral, which she had bought right. before she died and could have saved us a lot of exactly. time and trouble and money. Exactly. So yeah. but we didn't know. We yeah. didn't know. Communication is key. You got to make sure that uh, your loved ones know that you've pre-planned for sure. But people didn't used to use cremation as much as they do now, right? You no, know, that's right. It's It's been an amazing um, trend. So in the early 70s, only 5% of... Um, uh, dispositions were done uh, via cremation. And in 2035, which sounded like a long time away, but now it's only about 15 years away from next year, it's almost going to be 80%. So in 2015, that was a critical moment in the funeral industry where um, cremations crossed over burials in, in terms of the most popular way to take care of a loved one. Oh, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? You know, there are just a couple of, you know, different reasons, a, a kind of a, a congruence of things that has happened. You have the green movement, you know, you, your um, burial space is uh, limited. Mm -hmm. You have changing um, secularization of the U.S., so traditions, religious traditions have eased up a little bit, so that's another factor. You have certain um, immigrant populations that um, tend to favor uh, cremation over burial. And uh, also you've got a rising education level. You, again, also have um, families who are dispersed all over the country, and they can't always attend the funeral. You know, if, if you're living in the same community and grandma passes away, you're right there on the spot. Well, now people are in Anchorage, and they're in Florida, and they're all over the place. So this is a way to actually have the disposition done, and then the gathering is um, it comes afterwards. So you're separating the actual disposition of the loved one from the um, celebration of life. How did you find yourself in this business? Are Go you figure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. So I, I'm not um, a funeral director. The co-founder of the site, Scott Bradley, is. He is a third-generation funeral homeowner and has five funeral homes in the New Jersey area. So I was actually a management consultant. That puts me in a perfect position to run a company like this, right? <laughs> well, um, we certainly have uh, strategic uh, technology and operational experience. And Scott and I got together, and he had um, the brilliant idea of putting this site together. So he um, had the original site of Simple Cremation New Jersey, and I helped him with that, and I was um, an entrepreneur at that stage and worked with him with that. And it was so successful. Families around New Jersey really um, loved the site and were benefiting from it. It doubled year on year. We thought, why not take it nationally? So that's what we did. Wow. Does that make sense? Wow. Yeah, that's so simple to take something from a state nationally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Must I have know. Been, you know, why not? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I said. And probably a year later, I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> so, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, no matter where you live in the United States, so they can go to this site, yes. and it's based on your zip code or your right. area, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. can select a provider, mm -hmm. and wow. Yeah. And you also have a nice selection of cremation urns, too. I mean, it's uh, you have some beautiful urns on your site. Yes, yes. We, you can um, also uh, purchase an urn. And then our site, what we, what we love about it, what consumers love, and thank goodness we've had great feedback from consumers, is it's very simple. Because hasn't there been a lot of mystery and maybe even some mistrust, if I, I might be so bold to say that, from consumers to um, the funeral homes? This is very transparent. It, you know, we actually call it a shopping cart, which I think is probably a bit of an anathema, but uh, in terms of um, choosing your funeral services, but it's very easy to see. There's only a few uh, different uh, things you have to choose. We make some selections for you, default uh, to the, uh, the price that's most economical. You can make your choice and you have peace of mind. So you don't have like a large list of accessories you that don't. are on the website that somebody can buy? Or the funeral? Or yeah, you know, it's a great, um, great, great question. So one of the things that we um, pride ourselves in terms of our um, company and the brand values is not only excellence, but simplicity. 
we like to keep it really, really simple. So we don't overcomplicate things. And you have to remember, and I hope you haven't been in this situation recently, that when a loved one dies, you don't have all your faculties. You're, you know, there's a lot of stress. You're not uh, making decisions as clearly as you would um, with a, if you're in a situation where you're not grieving. So we wanted to make it as simple and easy to use as possible. I can identify. My mother died five years ago, mm-hmm. and she lived far away from me, and right. like I had seen her occasionally. But the way it affected me was really surprising. It I kind of went into shock. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You're in shock. So can you imagine making decisions that are um, pretty critical? at a stage where you are in shock. And now, if this is the right service and the right time, it's perfect. We're not saying that you never should go into a funeral home because absolutely, we believe in our partners. Um, I actually, and my own story is that um, my mother, my brother, and uh, my father all passed away. So my my brother, um, tragically, and then my um, father also fairly suddenly. So we definitely used a funeral home for that. Now, my mother, she wanted um, as simple, simple, simple as possible. And I know, Elizabeth, you and I have talked about this already. Um, We donated her body to science. That was my pre-simple cremation online days. But that was one of the genesis for the site. She wanted no cost associated with her disposition. She really wanted any money that she had to go straight to her beloved grandson. Yeah, my mom donated her body to science, too. Uh She really believed in science, and she's like, I don't need it anymore. Right, (laughs) right. right. You know, let somebody else benefit from it as much as they can, right? Exactly. So it's it's the right service for the right time and the right um, circumstance. So, Valerie, how has working in this business affected you? How has it changed you as a person? You know, one of the things that I've really loved that's been a surprise, Richard, is getting to know the consumers. And I love, certainly as um, uh, a leader of the company, there's nothing better than if you're running a business to really understand intimately what your customers are thinking, what their needs are. And that really has affected me to be able to give to others and really make a difference in their lives um, at this um, critical point in their life has been uh, really, really special. Do you find yourself talking to people who have relatives who have recently passed away and supporting them or giving them some sort of guidance? Or Yes, and, and, and coupled with my own experience that I've had, I definitely have been there for people. Yeah, Interesting. You probably get all kinds of personalities, too, like in terms of who you deal with. Oh, sure. No, the- and then actually, you know what, Richard, to your point, and it's a great, great point, Kenya, um, is that I was strictly in a corporate and public sector and academic environment prior to this. So now this is a B2C company. Mm. We're dealing with consumers. Mm-hmm. And oh boy, there's a whole bunch of different uh, folks <laughs> out there. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of emotions are at, at oh, this absolutely. time, right? Yes. All sorts of things. Absolutely. Their emotions run the gamut. And and the situations, you know, some are especially tragic and, you know. Yeah. One that was probably the most poignant for me was um, a young man called and um, he had said to me, you know, our, our, our site is set up that you make your choices and then you pay. And that's the way it goes. For the funeral homes, they know that they're going to get paid. He asked us if we would do the cremation. And, um, you know, our funeral homeowners are just great, great people, and very compassionate. And um, But I knew, know that that's our policy, that we really don't do that. But I did call up this particular funeral home and asked him if he would take on this case. And he said, because he said he had raised the money on Facebook. This is his uh, mom had died. And um, it ended up that, unfortunately, a very sad story that his father had murdered his mother. Mm. And he had raised this money on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And um, he was, Facebook was, you know, releasing the money. It was like a GoFundMe or, or whatever that is equivalent on Facebook. And the funeral homeowner said, absolutely, you know, we're going to help. So that is, you know, touching a person like that is huge, mm. you know, and to be able to give him the opportunity to save some money because you are reducing your costs if you're, you're arranging online. Mm-hmm. That was just very, very special. And give him some closure, too, because oh, yeah. very difficult circumstances. And a young man of, you know, he was um, just a little bit older than my son of, you know, the early 20s. Very, very sad mm-hmm. situation. And then when you think about you mentioning, Elizabeth, the whole, you know, emotionality about it, you've not only lost your mother, you've had a, another situation, you know, a, a crime as well as your, in your family. And then to have the wherewithal to do this 
we couldn't help but to help this young man out. Yeah, and I think for that generation, too, going online is much easier. Right, and they, just right. see how he funded it. He funded it online through mm-hmm. Facebook and was able to cover the cost um, very, very quickly. Oh, and, and this is one of the appeals of the site for people who really d- would prefer not to go into a funeral home. Definitely an option for uh, the future, and we see it uh, growing in leaps and bounds. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I need to do that for myself because I just don't want my kids to have to deal with all of that. Right. You know, yeah. I am I mean, I'm not afraid of, you know, any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but my kids are, they're your kids. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. It, does t- it definitely does take the burden and it's super quick and easy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and Valerie and I spoke too, like you don't even have to touch it. So you could just go online and say, somebody just died, just do it. And they do the entire soup to nuts. Mm-hmm. They will too. And people pre-plan it. with you, right? We, oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Very impressive. Thank you. Great Thank idea. You and it's simple simplecremationonline.com. Simplecremationonline.com. Yes. Yeah, Valerie Reed. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. You are listening to Rich and Elizabeth Gearhart on WR710, Passage to Profit. We'll be right back after this message. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A. A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to profit. We I, ran the gamut tonight, right? I, I mean, think I'm going to go change my password to give us. <laughs> <laughs> so to summarize, we had Shavis Camp, a cybersecurity expert. That's C-H-A-V-O-U-S-C-A-M-P.com. And Valerie Reed with SimpleCremationsOnline.com. And then a thrilling discussion about trademark terror with Kenya Gibson. Before we leave, any final words for our listeners? Shavis? Hey, stay safe. It's a nightmare out there right now, and it's only getting worse. Right now, every 14 seconds, someone gets hit, a new organization gets hit. And that was last year's statistic. It's getting worse. Okay. I'm scared now. (laughs) I'm going to go take precautions. You should be. (laughs) And Valerie? Well, would love to um, help serve those who, uh, when the time is right and the need is there and the online arranging is is your preference, we're here to serve you. Great. So thanks a lot, you guys, for coming. So, Valerie, you came from New Jersey. Chavis, you were here from? South Carolina, home of the Fighting Gamecocks. Yeah. And that other team that will probably make the national championship (laughs) okay and kenya from down the hall from From down down the hall hall. (laughs) so thank you and we would like to thank noah fleischman our incredible producer we depend on him so much and he only rolled his eyes a few times during the taping of this program (laughs) which i think is an all-time low for us mostly at the jokes (laughs) yeah and the whole iheart team so listeners don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another excellent round of pitches and you can start thinking about what your pitch will be and don't forget to like us on facebook instagram and twitter this is richard and elizabeth gerhardt from Gerhardt Law on iHeart with Passage to Profit, the inventor show on WOR 710, the voice of New York.